No, uh, I'm so grateful for Mark coming and speaking with us this morning, and uh, he did very well. It's good to, you know, for a man who don't normally speak, um, you know, spot on, mate. Well done. Excellent, yeah. Uh, yeah, excellent. When I came to the very first Israel and Prophecy meeting 10 years ago, uh, with uh, a, my good friend at the time, uh, David Hoyle, who has now gone to, to be with the Lord in heaven. I didn't think I'd still be coming 10 years later. You just don't know, do you? But it's so good to see that this group has grown over those years. Uh, I've been to so many groups where they've now fizzled out. I don't know whether that's me or what, but <laughs> you know, that they're not, but you're going strong and it's good. You're of like mind. So uh, it's good to be with you and to share with you. Uh, today. I want us to, to look for a few minutes uh, at a subject that we, we often quote but we don't look at uh, and it goes by pretty much uh, without saying but the seven year Antichrist peace treaty uh, because you know with everything that's going on we can easily forget that there are other things going on behind the scenes uh, and that's really uh, what I want us to look at for a, a, for a few moments today so let's just pray shall we Lord, we do thank you that your word is truth. And Lord, everything we need is in your word. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you that you have been so gracious to us, that not only have you saved us, not only have you uh, brought us into that relationship again with yourself through your son, but Lord, you have given us this guidebook uh, to, to enable us to walk with you. But not only that, Lord, we thank you for that uh, gift of prayer where we can literally talk to you and hear your voice. Father, I pray that you would talk to us again this afternoon, uh, that you would speak to us from your word and that you would glorify your name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, we, we often look about at the church being in the last days and we often look at the things of uh, the rapture. We look forward to the rapture. We look forward to, to the Christ returning at the end of that tribulation period as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, and as has already been and said, you know, we're on the winning side. We know uh, that he's going to come and he's just going to wipe them away with uh, the sword that comes from his mouth or the breath of his mouth. And, uh, you know... It, it, we look forward to that day when we are going to be with him forever and ever and ever. And we won't get tired of being in his presence. We won't get tired of worship. We won't get tired of, of bowing down and laying our crowns before him. It will be amazing. And uh, that should be what's on our minds when we see all these things going around, that we've got nothing to fear. This is coming. Um, but Israel... Uh, what's going on with Israel at the moment? What's going on with the peace process at the moment? Um, I don't intend to talk for ages and ages. I, I believe in stand up, speak up, shut up. Um, although now and again I go on. But um, I, I just really want us to look at a couple of things. One is, is there a biblical basis for such a treaty? Uh, such a, a covenant, if you like, through, with the Antichrist? Is it there? Uh, what does scripture say about it? Then I want us to look at the, the peace process, if you like, that's been going on since 1948. Because you might think that nothing's happening, you know, Israel is always at war. But what's been going on behind the scenes? Um, and, and, and what does the book of Revelation say about it? When, when is this going to begin, you know, this, this peace process? Um, and, and like all the topics that we've looked at, um, you know, these, there are things going on right before our eyes. Uh, they don't necessarily make the news. It, it seems to me that anything with, about Israel, unless it's bad news about them, doesn't make the news. Uh, but there is, there is a lot going on. Uh, actually, at the end of last year, Israel did make the news because, of course, they had elections uh, and they got a new prime minister. Or was he an old prime minister back? Um, of course, so Mr Benjamin Netanyahu came back. And there was real worries that... With him coming back and his very right-wing now government, so right-wing they've never had it like that before, would that upset any chances of peace within the Middle East? Uh, and of course they were very worried about that. But there were a couple of things that were going on while we were looking at that, and certainly in December. From December the 5th to the 7th, 2022, there was a meeting of the N7, 
You've heard of the G7, uh, you've heard of the G20, but this is the N7. And the N represents normalisation. So this is a meeting of the Normalisation 7. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, these are the countries that want normalisation with Israel. They want to get things on a, a footing that should be there. And those seven nations are Egypt, Jordan, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco and, of course, Israel. So they're the N7. Uh, and they were meeting to discuss uh, peace with Israel and how that would work and, and such like. Also, at the same time, uh, Israel's President Herzog was addressing the Atlantic Council in America, in Washington, about treaties and accords with Israel. So there was things going on, we just didn't hear about them, apart from when, of course, Benjamin Netanyahu's involved and then he seems to make the headlines. So with that in mind, let's just look at the biblical background, if you like, or the timeline um, about this peace treaty. The starting point appears to be in Daniel 7. So let's go, uh, sorry, Daniel 7, in Daniel chapter 9. So I'm going to read uh, from Daniel. Let's set the scene, chapter 9, starting at verse uh, 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God and his holy hill, while I was still in prayer... Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision." Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this, from the, right, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will, it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desol desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Daniel 9 is clearly speaking uh, about a, a, a specific timeline uh, and a specific set of weeks. But the interesting thing is verse 27 tells us that he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven and in the middle of the seven he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. We can easily miss this covenant because there it is, it's a, it's a verse and we can easily go over it, uh, and we can easily miss the context of it and, and such like. Um, but I want to make a couple of things very clear at, at the beginning. This is not a new covenant, okay? This is not a new covenant. It says, I will confirm a covenant, all right? We'll come back to that. Uh, the context itself is, is about Israel, of course, uh, and therefore it's, it, it's reasonable, I believe, to assume that the many that he's talking about will be the leaders of the people of Israel because they will be the ones that make the decisions. Just as we would say that Parliament would make our decisions uh, in, in that respect. Uh, and the third thing is that the temple must be up and running because in order to stop the, the, the sacrifice, the sacrifice must be running, if you see what I mean. Um, so there are a number of things sort of that are, are going along in conjunction with this. So the peace treaty will be confirmed, I believe, just prior to the tribulation. 
Uh, and I say that because there has to be a seven year period and of course the tribulation period is that seven years uh, and we see that halfway through the tribulation period that, that covenant is broken. So it must cover that final seven year period. Um, now that seems to give us a little bit of a link as well to Revelation chapter 6 where we read in verses 1 and 2, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked and there behold me, behold me, before me, sorry, was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. If you read that in its proper context, you'll see that chapters 4 and 5 have given us a picture of the throne room of God, of a resurrected Christ upon the throne. Uh, it also gives us this picture and this uh, um, placing on the throne the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Christ is taking his rightful position in, in chapters 4 and 5 when we see this picture of heaven and we see them praising the one who is on the throne and it is the, it is the Lamb that looked as though it had been slain. In other words, a resurrected Christ. That's what that re is. And so he is the one who is able to open the seals. Remember, John was weeping that there was nobody but the elder tapped him on the shoulder and said, there is one, and it's him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's him that says in chapter 6, come. Okay, so he's broken the first seal and he says, come. And so the white horse appears with its rider who is holding a bow and given a crown. Now, what does this description give us? What does it tell us about the white horse? Well, there are some that would believe that this is Jesus, of course, on the white horse. How can it be? Because Jesus is the one that's just said to the man on the white horse, come. It doesn't make sense for one thing there. But there are a number of things that we get from this that will show us that this rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. Okay, nothing but sure, but the Antichrist. And we get that from the fact that he, he, he has a bow, but no arrows. You know, when there's something missing in Scripture, it's missing for a reason. You know, nothing is in there that hasn't got a reason for it. So we have a man with a bow, but no arrows. So he's obviously not coming to fight, or at least not fight in the normal way we would consider fighting and wars and such. That's going to come in a little while with the next horse, of course. Um, but he, he has as well, he is given a crown. So here we have a man on a white horse with just a bow and given a crown. Now when we look at that, the word for crown here is the Greek word stephanos. So he's wearing, if you like, a stephanos. And that means a victor's crown. This is the sort of crown that one would get if they was in the Olympic Games and they'd just won the 100 metres. You'd get a Stephanos. You were the winner. You were the victor. When we look at the crown or crowns that Jesus wears, if you go to Revelation 19, where it tells us he's wearing the crowns, it's a different word. It's diadem or diadema, which, of course, is the crown of a king. A totally different crown. It's the crown royalty would wear. So there's a huge difference between the white horse crown and Christ's crown. Christ is the king of kings, lord of lords. This man's a counterfeit. There's no other word for it. It's a counterfeit antichrist. And so at the beginning of the wrath of God, because that's where the first horse comes out of, doesn't it? It's the opening of that first seal. It appears to start peacefully. He comes in peace, got no arrows. He's going to be a man uh, who is political in many ways. And he is the one, I believe, that will form this treaty uh, and, and, and begin the process. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians... Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Notice that Paul is not talking here of the Lord coming, but the day of the Lord. Okay, slightly different. Uh, and so we, we have seen that this peace treaty or this covenant of peace uh, 
will be for a seven year period and in the middle of it, it's going to be broken. We mentioned earlier in Daniel 9 that it appears that the Antichrist will confirm a peace treaty. Okay, so he's not going to make a peace treaty, he's not going to make peace, he's going to confirm something that must be already in existence because you can't confirm something that's not there. Okay, so we're sort of establishing that there's certain things going on here. But this man that's coming, this Antichrist, whoever he may be, is going to give whatever is in place by his confirmation, he's going to give it credibility and he's going to bring stability to the nation of Israel and what's going on. And in a sense, he will force the nations to act peaceably with Israel at least for three and a half of those years anyway, because then he'll go back on that. And so Israel is going to be going through a period of peace, peace and safety, a time when they've got their temple up and running. Now, we know, of course, we don't need sacrifice and offering, but you've got to remember they're still looking for their Messiah, aren't they? They're still in the old way. And so, you know, they want the... the, um, the, the sacrifices. They want the temple up and running. And, it, and in fact, of, co- of course, we have seen over the years that in Israel there are various institutions who have been getting ready. Uh, and they, they've done everything from uh, the making of everything that goes in the temple to the training of the, the priests and, and so on. To the point there, they've been uh, training on sacrificing the lambs. They've been doing all sorts of things. And of course, we've now got the red heifer in place and it's all just coming together. All haphazardly, of course. <laughs> yes, God's got nothing to do with it, has he? But anyway, God is bringing it all together to, to its uh, rightful Thing. So that's in a sense what, what's going on, if you like, in the background. So there is coming this peace treaty, but it's a peace treaty that's partly at least already there. It's developing uh, and he's going to stabilise it, if you like. So what about the peace that's existed since 1948? What's been going on since the creation of Israel? Because until Israel are back in the land, almost, prophecy had to sort of stop if you know what I mean because it's an important thing and people go well how can you be sure that the Lord's coming back now when for 2,000 odd years it's been the same Israel are back in the land it's an important thing really is an important thing and so when Israel announced its independence as a nation back in May 1948 it was immediately plunged into war immediately plunged into war uh, with the surrounding Arab nations And you could say, well, there's war been going on ever since. And and in a sense, that is true, of course. Um, But, you see, Israel has been involved in many different wars uh, since it became a state. The main ones, these are the main ones, there's been many other little conflicts as well, but you had the War of Independence that really cracked off, didn't it, for a couple of years against all the Arab nations. Uh, Then following on from that, uh, in 1956, we had the Sinai War with Egypt, um, Following on from that, in 67, we had the Six-Day War. Uh, Now, that was important because during the Six-Day War, of course, Jerusalem was totally retaken. Uh, The Gaza Strip was taken. The Sinai was completely taken. The West Bank and the Golan Heights. All the land that they should have had in the beginning was now taken, or most of it anyway. And then, unfortunately, they decided to give quite a bit of it back. Uh, I would say big mistake, but the Lord knows all about that, doesn't he? You know, uh, but that was the six. Well, then we had the Yom Kippur War in 1973, again against Arab nations, and then we could go on about Lebanon and, and all sorts. It's been at war ever since, and it has to be said that since Israel's statehood as was recognised by the UN in 1948, they have been on a constant war readiness. But you know, they're not an attacking nation. We hear on the news that Israel has attacked Gaza, Israel has attacked... No, they've been defending things that have come at them. You know, when you hear that they're going into Gaza, it's because they know where the rockets have come from. And I was talking to uh, uh, a brother in 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 the middle that Israel goes out of its way to tell the people they're coming. If they're going to hit a particular building, they drop leaflets to that building and they tell them to get out because tomorrow they're coming. It's Hezbollah and people like that that make those people stay where they are and, of course, then casualties occur. But it's not because Israel wants to do that. It's because of their own side 
who is using them as pawns in the game that they're playing. Um, but Israel has always called its forces the Israel Defence Forces. That's what they're for. They defend their country. They do not go out like the Americans did and invade and invade and so on. And obviously we've done the same thing over, over the years. They are a defence force. Because actually Israel is only in, it only wants peace. It longs for peace. It wants to live peaceably with all its neighbours. And you know it's got a lot to offer its neighbours as well, hasn't it? God says, you know, if you bless them, you know, they'll be a blessing. And they certainly have been uh, a, a blessing throughout the years. If you look at Israel's intelligence system, the, the Mossad is probably the best in the world. You know, um, you could say they're a bit like the Canadian Mounted Police. They always get their man because they do. They, they know what they're about. Um, you know, it's got a lot to offer. Uh, and they're very keen on when they lose a soldier or a soldier has got lost or, or what, they want that soldier back. And they will do things uh, and trade things in order to get their people back. Can you imagine if this government acted like that? Yeah. Their government would go, oh, we can't be bothered with that, you know. But they want everyone back. They are all part of that nation and they want them back. They're an amazing people. Uh, and they'll exchange prisoners and, and such like. So Israel wants peace, let's, let's be sure of that, uh, but not at any price, not at any price. They do have their red lines. We've seen Benjamin Netanyahu before at the UN with his little bomb on it with a red line on it where Iran's getting close and he says, that's it, that's where it's going. You know, Iran has time and time again gone, pushed past what America put in place to the point now where it wouldn't surprise me if they haven't already got a nuclear weapon. Uh, and there's actually, it's interesting actually that this week, after I prepared all this, I noticed that there were talks between Russia, um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia is worried about Iran uh, and it, I think it wants some assurances and it's seeking it from Russia, who's one of Iran's uh, allies. But we'll, we'll get back to that in a, in a sense in a minute. But, um, so as far as I can understand it, when you are attacked by an aggressor and in repelling that attack you take the land you can keep that land that's a national international sort of agreement but if you attack and take land then you have to give it back at a later date so whatever they tell you about israel taking people's land that's not true they are legitimately allowed to have the land that they took back which i might add god gave them in the first place OK, so, you know, I, I'm putting that there because th this is where it all hangs on the peace and, and, the, and the land, is it land for peace and so on. Um, so the Six Day War was, was one that gave legitimacy to Israel taking back what they should have had in the first place. In fact, when they went back to Israel, Winston Churchill was going to give them the whole of the land, including a bit of Transjordan, and with a stroke of a pen, he basically took half of it, if not three quarters of it, away. So they were only getting back what was already theirs. Uh, and as I say, it, there's also the covenants that God made uh, down the years that that would be their land forever. So we, we've, we've had this sort of state of, of war and, and such like all the way through since 1940, but there's also other things been going on. So how is this peace process, if you like, going to begin? Well, as I say, actually, it's already started, OK? Um, so we, we've already looked at the fact that the Bible clearly tells us that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant, not make a new one. Um, so he's going to take something that's already there and he's going to place his seal upon it, if you like. So firstly, what do we understand by the word peace? You see, because me and you live with neighbours and it's quite it's normal to say, well, I live at peace with my neighbours. What does that actually mean? Well, we just say hello. You all right? You know, OK, everyone all right? That's about it, isn't it? We live in peace. But when we're looking at a peace treaty, it has conditions attached to it. So this peace that we're on will have conditions uh, attached to it. And so we have to understand that this state of, of peace uh, means more than just living together. All right, there's got to be rules, if you like, to, to the peace. Now, uh, the dictionary, the Concise English Dictionary, says that peace means a state of quiet, calm, repose, public tranquility, freedom from war, concord. Well, 
you don't need actually an agreement to just sort of live in that way. You just get on with people. So this is a little bit more. This is a covenant. This is a binding agreement that involves Israel and the nations round about it. A contract, if you like, that has conditions to it. So this covenant will be binding on both sides and it will have terms. Now, that, that sort of thing is not actually stated in Scripture. It doesn't need to state it in Scripture. We understand what that means through what it's, it, it's certainly implied. But one of those terms, if you like, for peace has got to be that Israel presides over the Temple Mount. It's got to be, it's because it's part of, 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 of Jerusalem. And it's got to be where the Temple will be. Now, that we could argue all day of what's the position of the temple. All I would say to that is when Jesus comes back, he's going through the Golden Gate or the Eastern Gate, whatever you call it, and straight into the temple. So that tells me it must be in a straight line. But I may be wrong. Uh, but we'll, we'll worry about that another day, shall we? Um, so we've, we've got this thing going on. And then it says in Daniel 9, 27, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering and that the temple will be set up. So those things have got to be part of this. The temple, the sacrifice, the offering have all got to be part of this binding peace agreement. Now, the Muslim nations don't want to see that. The Muslim nations will say it's theirs. In fact, Rome will say it's his, you know, part of it, uh, part of Jerusalem anyway. Uh, and they've got to come to some agreement on that, whatever that may be. And I don't want to um, start putting things in that may not be the case. But there are obvious things, aren't there? And then the Antichrist is going to come along three and a half years later and he's going to nullify that. He's going to put an end to it. And not only is he going to put an end to it, he's going to um, erect this abomination that causes desolation. Now, we can again, we could go into that all day. What does that really mean? But it's got to be up and running and the Antichrist will nullify it. So this is clearly the work of the devil. There's no doubt about that. It's something that's evil. Uh, and of course, he's, he is a liar and he is a counterfeit. We, we said that this morning. Uh, and he breaks his promises. You know, there are many people in this world that have been promised things by the devil and they've gone down that line. Little do they realise that he'll break those promises and they will end up in, end up in hell, unfortunately. But that, that's the way it is. So this is clearly the work of, of the devil. When God makes a covenant, it lasts. Okay, when God says it, it lasts, it will never be broken. And so when God says, this is your land forever, that's exactly what he means. So he's faithful. Um, and of course, that, those covenants still uh, apply today. Anyway, going back to the subject, the first peace agreement, okay, which Israel had was with Egypt in 1979. Uh, 31 years after their independence. So it took a fair while. Um, to get this historic peace agreement uh, that was set up by uh, Jimmy Carter in the White House. And, uh, of course, that was the beginning of the Camp David Accords and such like. But there was peace between Egypt and Israel for the very first time. Now, the Arab League at that time was not happy with Egypt. They were certainly not happy with um, President Sadat. And he got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. But, unfortunately, he was also assassinated for the very same reason. Uh, because they didn't like it. But full diplomatic ties were established in 1982. So it took a while before full normality were, was brought in. But there was peace with Egypt. And then it took till 1994 for the next peace move, if you like, the next treaty to be signed. And this time it was with Jordan. Uh, Jordan... Um, as well as establishing peace between the two countries, um, who, who basically had officially still been at war since uh, the beginning of, of Israel. So they'd been on this state of war footing all that time. Um, they, they had this peace process, which enabled the two countries to live with, 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 with each other. And in fact, Israel benefited by having land the other side of um, the sea on the Jordan side, where unfortunately it's just had to give it up. You might have saw that in the news, that that treaty had come to an end. Uh, and they had to give up that land on that side of the, the Jordan. Um, but they had, that, it solved the water disputes that were going on through, through the Jordan and the Galilee as well. So for, for quite some time, that peace brought stability. Um, 
So that was Jordan in 1994. Um, and part of that deal was that jo the Jordanians could benefit from 50 cubic or million, 50 million cubic metres of water that came out of the River Jordan through one of its tributaries, the Yarmouk, um, so that they had water. So it was a benefit on both sides. You can see why they, they made that covenant of peace. But as I say, it's now finished and uh, Israel has had to vacate. That's the terms of the, the land bit. They're still at peace, don't get me wrong. Uh, they're still at peace. So. It's taken another 30 years for other na Arab nations to get on board with this. And so in 2020, we've seen a real push for peace. Uh, and we've seen, f first of all, we've seen the United Arab Emirates, which is a very small country, but again, normalisation, followed by Bahrain coming on. And just in the summer of 2020, we've seen Sudan and Morocco coming on board. So that's why we've got the N7. And they're still in, very much in talks, but you can see how peace is developing with the nations around Israel. The, these peace treaties are, are coming together. But from 1994 up until 2020, there had been nothing new in the, in the, in the, in the means of, of peace. Uh, and really, I suppose you could say that following the World Tr uh, World Trade Center attacks in 2001, uh, the Arab nations had severe pressure put on them in order to contain the Islamists that were doing all sorts of things. Uh, and so the, the Arab Peace Initiative was launched and that probably sort of stopped them looking at Israel and, and such like. Uh, but also, in 2002, the Saudis didn't want peace with Israel. They were not interested in peace with Israel. It didn't suit them. It didn't suit them at all um, because it suited them actually to have the terrorism in the area because that, that continued to give them, if you like, the dominant hand in, in the region. So everything was hunky-dory from the Saudis' point of view. It was all going their way. But in 2012, things started to change. And you have to ask yourself why the Saudis suddenly decided that they might want peace now in the region. Well, there were a couple of things that changed their mind. The first one was what we call the Arab Spring. We had these big uprisings going on which were destabilising uh, the area and of course they felt threatened. And so that was one of the things that sort of changed their mind, if you like. Then of course we've got the rise of Iran. You know, Iran has always been a bit of a thorn in the side, as it were. It's always said uh, of Israel that as soon as it gets a nuclear bomb, it's going to write Israel on it and send it over. You know, it's, it's, it's been very out there with that. It's made no secret of that fact. You know, and you can almost imagine uh, old nominee or whatever his name is sort of coming out going, are you finished yet? Have you finished? I, I want to I press the button. He's that keen to annihilate Israel. And so the rise of Iran has become a bit of a problem for Saudi Arabia because they are now um, a loose cannon, as you might say, in, in the region. Um, and of course, um, under Obama, they set up this, this thing to sort of try and bring calm to the region, trying to stop Iran um, getting these, in, uh, few, what do they call it? Thank you. Centrifuges and that in order to get the right amount of uranium and that that they want. Uh, so, and, and Netanyahu, of course, has always said that the red line was if, you know, they're not going to get this nuclear... And in fact, there have been a number of things that have gone on that Israel has been behind. They haven't outright said it, but you know, it's got their mark on it all over where certain people have been taken out, you know, that are um, important to them getting that weapon. Certain explosions have occurred and things like that uh, and of course people have been arrested and, and such like but um, you know Israel will not let Iran get a weapon uh, and I think as well at the moment there's talks with is it uh, Uzbekistan or one of those stands up the top there um, being told uh, about using their airspace uh, I say the stans because they all, they all end in stan and I never know which one it is, OK? So I'm not trying to be um, whatever, but uh, one of them anyway um, is, is, is looking into the fact that Israel might use their airspace uh, to get there. Uh, and thirdly, of course, we've got the, the withdrawal of US troops. See, while the US troops were in the region, there, there was a, 
an uneasy calm, shall we say. There was, a, there was something there that could stop uh, problems getting out of hand in the Middle East. So when Obama and Trump and Biden all said, well, we're not going to put any more troops on the ground, we're going to actually get rid of them, uh, take them out, that's made Saudi Arabia think a little bit more about peace. And so now they are looking that way. Uh, so we'll see. Now, I said earlier that when Netanyahu come back uh, in 2022, there was, um, there was this thinking that he would undermine the, the peace talks. But actually, um, he has promised to keep those peace talks going. And um, he has said a couple of things which I'll come, I'll come to in, in, a, in a moment. Um, so as far from December 2022, we have now this seven nations... Out without, without the Saudis, seven nations all, all normalising peace with Israel. Uh, so what that really means now is we've got a number of um, southern states and countries that are now all at peace with Israel. We've got a couple on one edge of Saudi Arabia, uh, and now we've got the Saudis and the Yemen and that that might come on board. There's a good chance they will, which just leaves the northern nations, if you like, still what I call hostile to Israel. Uh, but again, watch this space, it might all change. Um, but you see, Netanyahu believes that Saudi Arabia is the big prize. And so he's going all out to try and get peace with Saudi. In fact, he's already been to see the king uh, of Saudi. And so there is something definitely going on there. But he's made two very important statements, I think, uh, as well. And he said this, I intend to achieve peace with Saudi Arabia. OK, so he's got an intention there. But the second thing he said, and this is quite important, uh, is I intend to bring the Arab conflict to a close. They're bold statements. They're bold statements, but it does show that he wants peace and that he may well get it. So we come to the last sort of question, really. Well, what does the book of Revelation say about this peace? Yeah. Well, actually, it doesn't say much about it at all, <laughs> really. Uh, the only f information that we can glean from Revelation is that this white horse, this rider with uh, a bow and no arrows, with this crown, uh, is going to be probably the one that brings it all in. And um, apart from that, apart from the fact that it's going to come halfway through, he's going to break it, Revelation appears to be fairly silent on the matter. But that doesn't take away from the fact that the book of Daniel gives it a lot of credibility. Uh, we can see from, from the book that the treaty, in it, that's in Revelation, is going to be broken halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years in. Uh, and then we find that if, if you look past uh, the midpoint of tribulation in, in the book of Revelation, you see that the devil actually turns his attention on Israel. He's, it's like he's gunning for her now. Um, he's turned his attention uh, away from everything else and he's coming on it. And in, in chapter 12, verse 1, we see a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with a sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Very close correlation with Joseph's dreams, if you remember, back in, in uh, Genesis. Uh, so it's clearly speaking about the nation of Israel uh, when it's looking at that. And so in Revelation 12, it goes on to talk about halfway through the seven years and then it goes on to this, this sign and shows it to be Israel. And then he's coming for her. He's going after her with, with quite, a, quite a big zeal, if you like, to the point that he's spewing uh, sort of a flood out, if you like, to try and stop her. But the Lord takes care of it. The earth opens up and stops it. And we believe that Israel, of course, will go to a place of safety. Uh, funny enough, there are a couple of places that we can glean from Scripture that show that the southern sort of states down uh, towards sort of Egypt and, and Jordan will actually not be touched by uh, the Antichrist. And that's roughly where Petra is. And so there is this belief that the Lord will keep them uh, near Petra or, or thereabouts, um, keep them safe. When we go to Daniel, when he talks about the peace treaty, we see, we see the whole book of Daniel is, is a mixture of visions and, and things like that, but it's not haphazard because Daniel goes from being, there's the, there's the first vision of the statue and then we go through and he sees the different animals that represent the nations and, and we go through it and, and they're all bringing out part of history uh, as things go on. Uh, but also we see in, in Daniel's chap, uh, chapter 12, 
I think it is, hang on, uh, again, chapter 11, sorry. We, we see that there is a bit of a, a, a difference in, in time because the first um, 35 verses are all about the, 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 the prophecies that he's already given. But then we come on to, uh, from verse 3 to 30, sorry, verses 1 to 2 about the Medo-Persian Empire that is described in Daniel 2. Uh, which also brings in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. I, I'm not going to go too far into that, but what I'm saying is he, he's putting it all in an order. And then for, in, in that same chapter, Daniel 11, from verses 3 to 35, we see a history of what's already gone on. So if you want to look back in history, you, you'll see the kings of the north, the kings of the south, and you'll see that that all played out. But then uh, following that, we also see in that rather that uh, Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes IV was the one who desecrated the temple uh, and erected the altar to Zeus and sacrificed the pig on it, the abomination that we see. Of course, this was carried out during the time of the Maccabees. So we're seeing some things that are actually sort of mentioned in a sense by Daniel. Uh, but of course, Epiphanes is not the Antichrist, but he is a type of the Antichrist. And we see this in scripture with prophecy sometimes, that we see things happen over and over again, but it's not the real end time prophecy, and that's what we're seeing here. But when we get to verse 36 of chapter 11, we see something that is distant and still unfulfilled. Uh, and, and it goes on in, in verse 35 to 40 to see that it's talking about the time of the end. So there is a, a, there's a historical bit, and then there's a future bit sort of coming in. And in verses 11 to 13 of chapter 12, it states, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for it and reaches to the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way to the end, you will rest, and then the end of the days, or at the end of the days, you will rise and receive your allotted inheritance. So he ends by say, showing us something that's still to come. Now, before you say it, I can't answer questions about the 13 whatever days, because I haven't worked it out yet, and I'm not sure anyone might have done. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, I'll just sort of put that in there. But it's very interesting that the days that are mentioned here, um, you know, we have the times, time, times, and half a time, the 12, 60 days, they're all the same period of time, they're just put in different ways. And uh, it's, it's just interesting how Daniel sort of shows us and connects with Revelation, which he would have known nothing about at the time, of course. So what can we say in conclusion to the Antichrist treaty, this seven-year treaty? We can see there is definitely a biblical base for it. It's there. Daniel speaks about it. Uh, it's given to Daniel, not John. Okay, John, John's not told that. Daniel is. Uh, Daniel is given it through his visions. He's given an overview of events that are happening all the way through history, uh, going through the, the 70 weeks and, of course, the 69 weeks up to the death of Christ, and then this seven that we're waiting for, this tribulation period, which we will be out the way of, in my view. Um, but he's, he's given all of this. And so we, we get through Daniel, this, this prophecy overview um, that brings in this, this peace treaty. He gives us enough information to see who is going to do it, what it's about, and what's already in place. So we see now amongst us, while all the other things are going on, peace is going forward. And there is more and more coming on board. Now, it doesn't say that peace with the whole world will be there when the Antichrist comes, but that he will take from what is there and he will establish it. He will put his stamp upon it. And so, in, to me, this is just another uh, arrow to the, to the bow, if you like, of what is, how close we are to the coming of Christ. Because everything is, everything is converging, isn't it? In every, whichever way you look, we see con the converging prophecies coming to fulfilment. We see all these things taking place. We're witnessing in our day the nearness of the rapture of Christ. I've heard many people say the rapture cannot be long now. You know, we're talking about weeks, not years. I'm not going to get into that, but the, the rapture could come at any time. You know, we have to be ready. We have to be prepared. We have to know Jesus Christ for ourselves. If you are here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus for yourself, then I urge you, 
to find out. I urge you to, to, to realise and believe and, and look into the fact that he is God's son. He is God's one and only son and he came to die for you. He came and died upon that cross. He gave his life for your sin and my sin. And no matter what you think about whether you're a sinner or not, scripture tells us that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and we all need saving. And there is only hope in Jesus Christ. The one who will, if you like, give the shout and call us to be with himself is the one who's done it all. And so your only hope today is in Christ Jesus. If you're going to try under your own steam to go, you know what, I'm going to see this tribulation through. I'm going to get through to the end. Well, you're more of a man than I am. Because there's no way in the world that I see many people getting through to the end. There will be some. There will be some. I mean, we see all the way through Revelation that when these, um, these bowls of wrath and stuff that come, men are shaking their fists at God. They know it's coming from God, and yet they still shake their fists because they're deluded. They're, you know, they're, they've been taken in by this big lie. So what chance have you got without Christ? Christ has come, he said it will save us from the day of wrath. And I believe the rapture points to that. You need the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in your life. And as we said earlier, if you, if you don't know Jesus and you end up going through the tribulation and you take the mark of the beast, there is no way back from that. Uh, uh, you know, you can say to me, well, God is a God of love. Yeah, but in his word he said quite clearly that those who take the mark will be condemned. There is no way back. It's a, it's a horrific scenario, really, for those who don't know, don't know Christ. So get right with Christ today. Repent of your sin and turn to him you know, while you still have time. The, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, because you don't know whether you're going to get tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. So we can see that although these things were written thousands of years ago, it's all coming to fruition now. It's all coming together in, in our time in the days in which we live. So we need Christ, because only in trusting him will we be saved from these things. Amen. Okay, I did preach, uh, speak longer than I thought. Uh, right, I'm open to questions, except that one particular subject. <laughs> Bless you, brother, go on. I'll try and repeat the question, yeah. Yeah, sorry, um, you were saying about um, taking the mark of the beast, and did you hear about uh, John MacArthur? when he said that, oh, it's okay to take uh, the mark of the beast, then he went into some kind of, I don't know, you know, it's uh, really, um, it's really scary, actually, because he yeah. was a, a very big following, Southern Baptists, you know, yeah. preaching, and, yeah. and for him to say something like that, yeah. Uh, hang on. John, John, it's been said, John MacArthur has said that it's okay to take the mark of the beast. I'd like to know where he gets that from in scripture. Yeah. Because when I read scripture, it says the absolute opposite. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's a question that I can't answer now, but I, I sorry, it, uh, a point that's been put forward that um, the first resurrection will be uh, at the time, well, it's roughly Re Re Revelation 18 or, or such, uh, therefore the rapture will have to come at the end of the tribulation. Um, I've heard that put forward before, but I don't think that's a, a, the right uh, understanding of scripture. But it's something, I'd rather talk to you about that afterwards than... Take a, go on. In Matthew 24, he say first it will be wars and rumors of war, and then it will be, be a great tribulation where I've ever been, the whole chronological, right? And yeah. he say, you will go through the tribulation, not the rebellion of Christian, the love, the twin in the rapture. And then say, after that, it will be the sun go dark, the moon go like black, and then, and then after that, Jesus come back, and one will be taken, one will be left. Yeah, that, so that's the rapture, after the tribulation, because... 
March 24 is chronological. And then you see Second Thessalonians 2 is saying regarding the rapture, they said the, uh, the, the man of sin will be revealed first, and then Jesus come back and destroy him with his coming. So that point therefore after the tribulation, because he said here, regarding the coming of Christ, yeah, first will be the, 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 the falling down, the apostasy, yeah, and then uh, if the man of sin will be revealed, and at some time after the man of sin is revealed, the rapture happened and Jesus destroyed with his coming. So we are, we are no better, all, all the first apostles of Christ, they were, uh, they died martyrs, St. John, and we are no better than they were, yeah? So, okay. So we are all going to the tribulation, and we need to be in the tribulation to preach the gospel. No, no, so right, okay. The, I, I'll just say two things and then I, I'll move on. First of all, let me just ask you what I call a logical question, and I, I don't mean any offence, um, is this. Why would Christ come and save us and then put us through the same thing that he's saving us from? Okay, it doesn't make sense. But as far as having people on the earth to evangelise, whatever, that's what the 144,000 are, are, are about. The, the 144,000 from the people of Israel will be marked with the mark of God and will go throughout the whole earth. Uh, and there will be people saved. There will be people saved. But I, no disrespect to you, but I'll carry this, we can carry this on afterwards if that's right. Yeah, I know, you, I know you can, but I think we're taking up too much time. Yeah, I, I'd like to get a few more questions, but I'll, I'll come back to you afterwards. Hello. I want to know in Daniel chapter 9, why is there a gap between Daniel 69 weeks and Daniel 70? In a very quick thing, it's called the Age of Grace. Okay. Sorry, why, why is there a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week? Um, the, the timeline from the, from the very beginning starts with uh, the decree to build uh, the city again and goes right the way through to Jesus dying upon the cross. Um, and then, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to then put that seventh week right straight back because no one will have the chance to be saved, if you see what I mean. But God has given us an age of grace and we don't know how long that is. But of course, there are things that are occurring that sort of point to the fact that we're now coming to the end of that age of grace. And then this final seven years is what the revelation of John is all about. The whole of the book of Revelation, apart from the very beginning where it sets the scene for the church, is all about the God, God's wrath upon the world in, in tribulation. Uh, in my understanding. But there, there's warnings, of course, because God's judgment always begins with the house of God. And so the, seven le the letters to the seven churches are saying to the church, get your house in order. Yeah. And he says it to us, if we take us as the, the church of Laodicea, which historically, we, I believe we are, we're in that place now, God says, basically, if you don't let me back in, if you don't repent of your sin, I'm gonna, you're, you're lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And you look at the church today, and the majority of the church today, unfortunately, is going to be spat out of God's mouth because we're lukewarm. We need to be red hot. We need to be for him. But then the rest of it is that seventh week. It's, it's, I can only, you know, the only thing I can put that gap down to is the grace of God. That me and you, and whoever he may call, can be saved. Yeah? Does that answer? Okay. Sorry, sir. I, um, I was just because uh, I, I had a, a different part of my question as well uh, before. Yeah, um, sorry, I'll cut you off. Uh, Thessalonians uh, 5, verse 3, when it says, um, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Is that to do with the peace process in some form as well? Or? I, I believe that's to do with the, uh, the Jewish nation who are in that period of peace and safety because of the peace treaty. Peace treaty. Uh, and then, of course, then they don't know that the um, Antichrist is going to break that covenant. They're going along thinking, this is great, isn't it? We're at peace, you know, everything's all right. But then suddenly he turns, bang, and it comes. And I th that's what I believe that that refers to. I can see a man at the back, I think. Um, yeah, There's a light behind you. It's about the nation itself. You said about Iran. Was it Iran? Saudi and Russia. Saudi and Russia. I was reading an article as well, also that China is getting involved with that as well. So my question is, because China is getting involved in that, is Saudi Arabia indirectly saying to the United States, 
get over here again and help us. Okay. Um, in the Middle East. The I mentioned. East, yeah. I mentioned three nations getting together: Russia, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Iran. And, China is in, in, in involved in well. yeah, my friend here has said that China is now getting involved. Is that Saudi's way of saying to America, you better come back over and get involved? Uh, it's a good question. Thinking on my feet, I, I would tend to think we, we are looking, of course, that the whole world is on the brink of, a, of war. Yeah. Uh, and it seems to me that instead of trying to defuse war, uh, the powers that be are trying to increase those chances of war uh, because it has many effects. One of them, it will depopulate the earth even further. But of course, I, I don't think that that whole world war will come until we see the, the tribulation coming out because that's what those other horsemen uh, will, will bring. You know, uh, it'll bring death and war and destruction and then plague and so on, which always follow war. Um, but Yes, you could be right, because, you know, it's all about this diplomacy that the, the Saudis are feeling very vulnerable, I think, at this moment. Having said that, that's why I think uh, Netanyahu will get something out of Saudi for Israel, because they're a nu cause Israel are a nuclear nation, that will give them a little bit of uh, thing. But we will have to wait and see. And also, Steve, um, they're running out of oil, so they've got a thing to do not Absolutely. Yes. Why has Israel suddenly been given all the oil? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it does t tell us that the um, Gog and Magog will be, you know, they'll have a hook put in their jaws and bring them out. What could bring them out more than oil? Uh, it's, not, it's not accidental that Israel has just suddenly been given the world's richest oil uh, deposits, uh, which everybody wants. So, you know, Israel is going to become the centre of it all again, I think. You've got to keep your eyes on Israel. Steve. I thought you were nodding off, sorry. I've got a question. <laughs> we are getting tired. Um, I know it's the, it's the argumentative issue. Um, I've always thought the point of a rapture was to basically get you out of the way a bit lively before... Something happens. It's that, that hard puzzle word, isn't it? Which means literally to take you to out, snatch, to snatch you from. And I, I could never work out um, why we all go through the tribulation. We all end up absolutely on our knees, and then God emergency evacuates you out just before he comes back. Anyway, I've never seen the point of it. No, no. I, I know that's not a theological. You know, I, I know that's not an argument for anything, but I still can't see the point of going through it all. God rescues you from something that you've already been through and then come straight back down again anyway to rule the Lord. I can't work it out. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, um, Mark has basically said, um, I'll, I'll use the word, it's, it is illogical to think that the Lord would allow us to uh, go through that tribulation and then at the very last minute pluck us from it, uh, having gone through sort of nearly seven years. Um, and. There, there are a number of people that would go, well, of course, the rapture theory being at the beginning has only been around since Derby and all the rest of it. Actually, when you research it properly, you'll find actually it goes far, much further back that. The early fathers believed the same thing. Paul believed in uh, the imminence of, of Christ's return and, and such like. Um, but, it, you know, you don't have to... I don't think you have to be a huge theologian or whatever to understand uh, the fact that if you just look at God being who God is, a God of love, but also a God of wrath, that why would he save you from wrath but put you through it? That, you know, why, why did he save Noah out of the flood? Why did he save um, Lot out of whatever? There's, there are so many places in scripture that point to the fact, there was one in the Psalms I read the other day, I can't think where it was, but it says, and he saved me out of the wrath. Um, you know, there are so many pointers that tell us that it can't be that way. Now, I understand where you're coming from in the fact that you've got, you've got the, the, the people that are at the end. I believe they're the ones that have been saved through the tribulation. I haven't got time to go all the way through it, but there's clear points that show that that will be the case. Uh, but, but we, will, we will not be there as, as believers. The church is missing after chapter 5 through to chapter 19. It's missing. Um, so I would urge anybody... I'm, I appreciate that there are many people think many things. Um, you know, my way of, of believing is what, I, what I've learned over the years, what I've studied for myself. And I always say to them, study it for yourselves. Because, 
you then come to the truth that's your truth, if you like, rather than being told something. I, I hope that when today's finished, I will get to you, um, I hope today when today's finished, you'll go home and go, now let's look at what Steve said. Let's look at what Mark said. Is it right? You know, find out for yourself. Because I always say this to, from the pulpit, that when people come on a Sunday to, to the church, you know, you listen to me for three hours or however long I'm preaching for. <laughs> Go home and look at it and see if I've got it right. Because you have a duty, if I haven't, to come back and tell me I'm not right. Absolutely. Sorry, I've got about three hands. Uh, were you first? Linda. Linda. There are two quick questions. The first one, many believe it's called conversions. Many believe it's called conversions. Sorry, I still didn't get that. Ben Kavir of Israel. Ben Kavir. Ben Kavir. Right, yeah. okay. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. Do you think they would do the sacrifices before they built the temple like Nehemiah? Well, they are practising sacrificial now. Do you think they would do it before the temple was finished like Nehemiah did? No, I don't, I don't. I think everything needs to be in place. I think. Well, yeah, we've got the, the whole temple situation. We'll have to because we've got to remember they're looking at it from an Old Testament perspective. So everything would have to be um, cleansed properly. That's where, as you say, the red heifer comes into it. And then, one, once, once that's. But you've got to remember also that God's not in that temple. All right, this is not God's temple. This is, this is Judaism's temple, if you want to call it that. Oh, absolutely. The city of Neon. Right. And to house nine million people, everything within 20 minutes, you can get from one right. end to the other. Yeah. Do you think that's like a town of Babel? And would they finish it? Because they never finished Babel in Is This a Town of Babel? Can you repeat Linda's question, please? Yeah, I'm trying to think. So, this town of Neon yeah. is being built in Saudi. Right, okay. Okay, so we've got this city that's going to house nine million people. Yes. And it, it's based... Because they know they have no arms, so they know you've got to make it more one city. Right. So it's going to be one of these 15-minute cities that we... Well, yeah, yeah, give or take five minutes, yeah. They are estimating the length of building. Would they finish building it, or would it happen like the Tower of Babel? They never finished. Right. Will, will they finish building this, um, I'll call it a 15-minute set, set, before all this comes to pass? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 dev, the devil is, is at work. I've seen the plans. Yeah. And it's like Cain Gardens and it's got yeah. the and it's got yeah. the You do not need any car, yeah. nothing. No. no oil, nothing. Yeah. And the water that, glasses, the sun yeah. Heating, yeah. And all the hot water. Okay. Yeah, the 15, 15 minute city that will be there will be, well, powered by solar and all of those things, so it won't need that. Yeah, but the question is, will they finish it in time? Yeah. I can't answer that. I really can't answer that because I don't know when the Lord's going to come and when that yeah. whole thing will activate. Okay. We're going to pause and have some questions from people online. Oh, yeah? Well. So let's take maybe uh, two here. Okay, I was going to say, you've been waiting for quite some time. Can, can I just say, a few months ago, I was listening to something or reading something, and it was like a light bulb came on about the tribulation and what it's about. And it's about God's wrath being poured out on the earth for mm. the three and a half years that I've done. And I thought of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, all of God's wrath was poured out on the Lord Jesus. Now, the Lord Jesus lives in us as we believe in him. We are his temple on earth now. So would God pour out his wrath on the living temples with Jesus in us again? It's like punishing Jesus again on the cross. And that finished it for me. We cannot go through the tribulation because God is pouring out his wrath on the Lord Jesus again. And it's as simple as that. What other people believe, but I just thought God is 
not going to punish the Lord Jesus who is living through his living church. He cannot, because then it would mean that he didn't punish Christ fully on the cross. It nullifies the work on the cross if God's wrath is going to be poured out on Jesus again in the earth. Right, let, let me try and get that onto, onto the, onto the so thing. Uh, yeah, uh, it sounds a very valid point that the Lord Jesus Christ... So, hang on, I, I need to bring this one out. The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ lives within us. We are his temple. Uh, the Lord has already poured his wrath on Christ at his, at his death. So why would he basically do that again? He, he wouldn't pour out a wrath, his wrath on his own son. Uh, and that does make very logical sense. So thank you for that. I think I've got to go to you now, haven't I? Oh, yeah. Lisa, mine, sorry, Lisa. <laughs> mine, mine isn't so much a, a question, but to say yes, totally very. Totally but also the, the first, the first three and a half years, as you say, is like the Lord was made coming as a, as a man of peace, complete counterfeit. And it's God's wrath, obviously, that's poured out in the last three and a half years. And the thing is, the church can't, as it were, be on the earth, for obviously for that reason as well, but also because God's dealing with Israel at that point. And he's using Israel as his yeah. weapon of warfare. Because yeah. he says Israel is his weapon of warfare. So, right. yes, he, he's going to be, obviously, um, drawing, obviously, um, Jewish people to himself. Obviously, he's drawing Israel to himself. But he's also going to be punishing the nations as well for their treatment of Israel. So yes, he'll be protecting Israel, he'll be drawing people out, there will be people that will be saved. But, but also it's the fact that if the church is still on the earth, that's Jew and Gentile together, made one in the Messiah, that's the church. But, but, but he's actually going to be dealing specifically, obviously, with Israel, fulfilling the rest of his... His word in scripture. So I don't right. understand all the incidents, no. but scripture is clear um, with the fact of who he's dealing with. Uh, I have to say, I totally agree with you. I can't remember all of that now if you're on Zoom, uh, but, ba but basically, um, yeah, it's a, a, a for, for the um, rapture at the beginning. I'll just leave it at that. Last question. It's just two little speculations. I know you don't know the answer, but I'd just like to know your take. Do you think that the BRICS, the five current BRICS nations with another five joining, could be the ten nations? Mm. Mm. Brazil, Russia, right. India, China, yeah. uh, Saudi Arabia, no, South Africa, they're falling together for their own currency, and they want to get rid of the petrodollar for, for trading in oil, and Iran, Egypt, Turkey, and two others are about to join. Mm. Making it mm. Interesting. Um, about that's about the BRICS nations, the nations that are joining together to get rid of the petrodollar. Um, what are my thoughts on that? Um, I have to say, I haven't really thought about that. Um, I think I think whatever comes along, I, I, whoever's involved, there there will be ten nations for a point at the end. Um, the Antichrist clearly comes along and uproots three of them. Um, uh, and so, therefore, there will be eight nations left. No, I haven't miscalculated. All right, if you look at it properly, no, there'll be eight because he comes alongside those, um, uh, the Antichrist, who will then eventually rule uh, after they've given him their thing. So I'm not so sure it really matters who is going to be there, but at the end day, whoever is there will give their power and, and authority to the beast and the beast will rule for a time. Um, we have to just watch that. Watch this space, I think, with that one. And also, just quickly, um, the Abraham Accords that Trump put together, do you think that might be what will be confirmed if he comes back next year? I'm, I'm not so sure that Trump got too much in place, to be honest. I think what Israel put together will be more likely to be the thing. Uh, um, Trump is almost yesterday's news now, isn't he? He's, you know, but what Israel's doing and making peace with those nations, I think, seems to be more prevalent, if that's the right way. Did you say you got one online or something? Yes. If you ask them, they'll be able to hear you. Who's the person online? I think Quellery. Okay, can you hear that? Yeah. Please. Yeah, I can hear you.
Yeah. Well, there is speculation there, you're quite right. And you were quite right to pick me up on the fact that it is the angel that says, uh, come, but of course Christ at that point is the one who's opened the seal uh, as opposed to coming out. But when it says uh, conquest, you, you can conquer without war and he will, co- he will politically conquer uh, and bring peace. It, it, so that's not out, of, um, it's not out of context, if you like, um, who else, who else could take that place apart from the Antichrist? So, well, I, that, the bow well, I, I think the, I think the bow sim, sorry, I think the bow symbolises the fact that he has power and authority, uh, as opposed to the fact that it's um, an actual weapon as such. Um, I've got, I've got no idea. You're going to have to ask God that one. <laughs> it, it could be that it could. I mean, obviously Jesus is going to have a scepter. So, this, is, you know, I, I, these are things that I just can't say any more than what's there in Scripture. But I think Scripture quite clearly does point to the fact that the Antichrist will rise in a, in a way that is not just straight into war. He'll be a man that has, let, if, if we take it, if we take it through its natural thing, the rapture has occurred. Okay, there is going to be a big void in the world that people are going, what's going on? What's going on? Uh, And he will rise and say, I can sort all this out for you. It will be in a a, a peaceful political way, I think, to try and bring some suitability, um, whatever. Any more than that, and apart from the fact that he's not wearing a crown that Jesus would wear, he's not got a scepter because Jesus has it. Um, He's got the appearance being white of being something like Jesus, but that's what he's about. He's, it's counterfeit, and, and that's all I can say on that one. Another person online. No, we are going online, please. Hold on. Koi just has solitude. Okay, go ahead. Um, quite firstly, thanks for uh, the session this morning. Um, I just have a practical point of view. Um, I just wanted to kind of pick your brains of what would you suggest on a day-to-day basis I think it has to be like it's always been. We should be a witness for Christ in in the way we think and the way we do things. I don't think particularly, if if I'll take it from the one end to the other, if we know what's coming, we know the outcome. We can't stop the outcome, but we know that Christ wins. So is it worth putting a lot of energy into trying to come against some of that stuff? Or is it more worthwhile showing Christ to people as he is in order to bring, hopefully bring them to salvation. Um, but there are things that we can do as well, of course. Shut the news off for one thing and don't listen to it. You know, don't, don't spend your life on Facebook and TikTok because they just fill your head with all sorts of things. But you can have a mobile phone because I remember I got someone upset about that last time. Um, so, you know, but be careful what you do with that. But, but try and keep your mind... On, on, on the Lord and the things of the Lord. I mean, you know, I'm in the same position as you. We live in a world that is totally depraved, totally evil, but we are not of this world, but we are still in it. And so we have got to show people that we are different. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just, I think, living in a way that would bring glory to the Lord in what you do. And I know that we fail every day, but we've also got that hope and that trust for the future. And if that hope and that trust doesn't put a smile on your face and a bounce in your step, then I question your hope and your trust. 
not because you know I don't I don't believe in the fact that I mean we've we've looked at some very sort of dark subjects in a sense this morning, but you know at the, I have I have a peace within that keeps me going. And when people go, oh, you know, why, what, what is it? Well, I know the Lord's coming. You know, he, he's there. He's within my heart. I know He's coming. I know He's coming. I'm a winner, and it doesn't matter what. You know, we can say, like, we put, it doesn't matter what man does to me. You can kill me, but that's as much as you can do. And what happens if you kill me? Praise God, I'm going to be with him in heaven. That's all I can say to you, my friend, uh, is just live for the Lord as best you can. I think Mark said earlier on as well that whatever you do, do it for the Lord and, and do it to the best of your ability so that people will ask you, why do you do it that way? What's, what's you know, um, and, and the Lord will keep you. I, sorry? We look forward to the day. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think perhaps we should bring it to an end, do we? Yes, we should. Oh, I've got yes, one, right. one last one then. You are the last I one. I just want to make two comments. One of them is um, the most convincing argument that I've heard about that we are not going to go through the tribulation is that we're the bride of Christ mm-hmm. and that God is not going to be his brider. <laughs> It's a good way of putting it. Good way of putting it. Every other argument that really convinces me that he loves us and we're his wife. And the bow in the uh, Revelation 12 scripture we just looked at, it refer, I've heard it refers back to the bow of um, that God gave Noah in the clouds. It's a covenant. It's a bow that is it is a covenant. So he's going. So this false, this antichrist is going to bring a covenant. He's going to have a covenant in his hand that people are going to be convinced that he's bringing peace. To the world. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for for listening. You've worn me out. When I've got when I've got my breath back, we'll chat further. Better catch your breath. Yeah. Thank you for listening patiently. Can I say some of these questions can never be fully answered? in one sentence, you know, uh, 